On the morning of Saturday, July 6, 2013, Asiana Flight 214, a Boeing 777, struck a seawall at San Francisco International Airport, killing three and injuring nearly 50. It was the first crash of a Boeing 777 that resulted in fatalities since its entry to service in 1995. The crew's failure to follow a number of procedures played a role in this accident. This was one of more than a dozen airline or commercial charter plane crashes the National Transportation Safety Board has investigated in the last 10 years involving crew members' failure to follow procedures. The NTSB is so concerned with this ongoing problem that it put strengthening procedural compliance on its most wanted list of safety improvements in 2015. Procedural compliance is following the appropriate procedure at the appropriate time. Procedural compliance makes you a more reliable pilot, especially if you are fatigued, distracted, or stressed. During investigations, we often see pilots not following procedures related to flying stabilized approaches, not maintaining sterile cockpits, not monitoring critical flight parameters such as proper airspeed, and not heating aircraft limitations. We're also seeing missed or incomplete briefings and checklist omissions, as well as missed or poor callouts. The NTSB has made recommendations that would strengthen compliance by ensuring that air carrier procedures are adequate, that air carriers adequately train pilots on those procedures, and that crews follow the procedures. The recommendations seen here have been largely directed at manufacturers, air carriers, and the FAA, because we recognize that everyone, not just crew members, play a part in procedural compliance. Let's take a closer look at these common deviations from procedures using examples from some of the crashes the NTSB has investigated. First, procedures related to flying a stabilized approach. A number of breakdowns in procedural compliance occurred in Asiana, the foremost of which was the failure to follow a stabilized approach and go around. The thrust lever is at idle, and the descent rate well above 700 foot per minute needed to maintain the desired glide path the flight crew should have determined that the approach was unstabilized and initiated a go-around, but they didn't. As the approach continued, it became increasingly unstabilized as the airplane continued to descend below the desired glide path. Now, let's look at what happens when crews don't maintain quiet or sterile cockpits at critical times. In the Colgan crash, we found that the captain had engaged in what we call a non-pertinent conversation during a critical phase of flight which is contrary to procedure and regulation. This distracted them from their flying duties. The crew squandered time and attention they should have used for operational tasks, monitoring, and preventing errors. In Charleston, we found that the captain of a PSA Airlines flight was engaged in a non-pertinent conversation during taxi. This distraction likely contributed to an improper flap setting and a dangerous runway overrun after an aborted takeoff. Fortunately, everyone lived but it reminds us all of how distracting and dangerous non-pertinent conversation can be when trying to perform critical tasks at critical moments. Now, let's take a look at what happens when you trigger a procedure for a go-around, but don't make the go-around. This safety issue surfaced in the crash of Empire Airlines Flight 8284 in Lubbock, Texas. The crew of an ATR-42 flying an approach in icing conditions experienced a stall warning the inexperienced first officer allowed the airspeed to decrease while the captain was troubleshooting a malfunction. Company procedures required them to recover from the stall and at that point to conduct a go-around. Instead, the captain chose to continue the descent. He did so even though the first officer asked if she should go around. The airplane descended into the ground short of a runway and was substantially damaged. One of the most basic procedural requirements is adhering to aircraft limitations. Maximum takeoff weight is one of those limitations, and yet in 2012, a Convair 440 captain took off at a gross weight almost 7,000 pounds above the maximum allowable weight for its configuration. The airplane had difficulty climbing and crashed during an attempt to return to the airport in Puerto Rico following engine failure. The normal maximum gross weight had to be reduced significantly when the anti-detonation and auto feather systems were not operative and in use. The NTSB found the pilots of this company were either not aware of this limitation or had just routinely ignored it. 
finally, let's look at the critical importance of following checklists and making required callouts. Consider two crashes, the UPS crash in Birmingham, Alabama, and a lesser known accident involving an East Coast jet crash in Minnesota in 2008. The UPS flight crashed short of the runway for a variety of reasons, including not flying a stabilized approach, but it was also a prime example of the captain and first officer failing to follow checklists and making the proper callouts. Both died in a crash. A number of factors also played into a charter jet crash. The captain failed to conduct a proper approach briefing, used non-standard terminology, failed to execute checklists, and did not effectively communicate and coordinate with his co-pilot during an approach in stormy weather. The co-pilot made an inaccurate call out after landing and then was caught by surprise when the captain attempted a go-around. The airplane struck the localizer antenna and crashed in a cornfield off the end of the runway. In both crashes, the pilots did not consistently apply standard procedures and did not reinforce one another's actions. So what can we learn from these investigations? Procedures are put in place to minimize variations in our performance and to increase human reliability. When we fail to follow our SOPs, we lose a valuable barrier that could help prevent errors which may come about when we are tired, distracted, stressed, or inattentive. Indoctrination and training is critical in order to establish a commitment to standardization. When companies and pilots do not consistently apply and reinforce standard operating procedures, deviation becomes common and crews begin to accept deviations as normal. Without real commitment, it becomes easy for crews to skip tasks like completing briefings, reading and doing checklists verbatim, and making accurate and valid callouts. The crew concept depends on crew members interacting as a team. Safe flight requires all crew members not just the most experienced ones, to listen, watch, monitor, and call out deviations. In this video, we have shown you a few examples of accidents caused by crews not following procedures. The question is, why do crew members sometimes fail to follow procedures? There are several reasons pilots ignore or deviate from procedures. One, they may not understand the reason for the procedure or why it is important. Two, they notice others deviating from procedures and gradually learn to ignore them. And three, they simply choose to deviate. Both crews and companies must understand why procedures are in place, why they are important to follow, and the risks associated with failing to follow them. All crew members should routinely assess their own compliance and speak up if they see someone else is deviating. If crews think a procedure is needed, or an existing procedure is inappropriate, they should speak up to their management. But until the company decides to make a change to a procedure, crews should follow that procedure. When crews develop the habit of following checklists, doing briefings, and making call-outs every time, they begin to do these things reflexively, even when they're stressed, distracted, or tired. By working together, carriers and crews can produce strong procedural compliance and ensure that the highest safety standards are maintained.